We are living in a moment of decisive change in world history. There is absolutely no precedent in the entire history of the world for what you're seeing now. In 200 years of capitalism, there has never been an economic uh, crisis on such a vast global scale, which is now dragging every single uh, country down in a downward spiral. And now we see a decisive change even within that change. It is a dialectical law that human consciousness always lags behind events. That is to say, even a, even a great crisis like this is not automatically registered in people's consciousness. It takes time for consciousness of the masses to, to, to bring itself up to the level of, of, of reality, if you like. And this process does not happen in a slow, gradual manner. It happens suddenly in an explosive manner, with a bang. <laughs> that, that is precisely what a revolution means. That's what it is. And we're now entering into that situation, that new situation. Even in the past few weeks, the past month or so, events are moving on a, on a world scale <laughs> with lightning speed. The, the speed of events, it, it takes your breath away. Take, for example, the magnificent revolutionary movement in Turkey. Which apparently came like a thunderbolt from a clear blue sky. I say apparently because that's not uh, correct. Great events in history never come as, as, a, as a, a bolt from a blue, clear blue sky. What happens is, is this. Beneath the surface of apparent calm and stability, And what I am saying goes for every single country in the world, without any exception. Even Switzerland. <laughs> or even, dare I say it, Austria. Beneath the surface of apparent calm and peace and stability, There is a seething growth of discontent, of anger, perhaps above all of frustration, which is seeking a way out to draw an analogy with geology. We, we are now in a very uh, uh, geologically active part of the world, right here. Greece is on a fault line, actually. It's on a fault line. 
Look around at this nice, peaceful, calm scenery. And you have no idea, you have no idea of the seething mass of, of, of high temperatures and high pressures just a little bit beneath the surface. Just a little bit. The task of Marxists are scientists. We, we, we base ourselves on dialectical materialism. And therefore, we should understand these things. And we should not be taken by surprise by sudden explosive developments. For looks at the bourgeoisie, the so-called experts of the bourgeoisie. Their superficial empirics, purely empirical. They don't base, the, they think they base themselves on reality. They don't base themselves on that. They cannot see any further than, than their own nose. Look at the facts. Look at the facts. Okay, let's look at the facts. What were the facts in relation to Turkey? The economy was going forward for the whole of the last period. Going forward fast at 5%, even 7%. That is the explanation why Erdogan's regime appeared to be stable. And if you look at the facts, the so called facts, there's absolutely no indication whatsoever of any movement in Turkey. And yet, within a question of hours, on a small issue, a local issue, although, although it is quite an important issue for the people in Istanbul, they, want, they wanted to build a, a, what's it, a, a, a shopping mall on, on, a, on a park. There were demonstrations. The demonstrations were brutally repressed by the police. And within 24 hours, Istanbul, this beautiful city where tourists go, Europeans go to amuse themselves. The streets of Istanbul were filled with gas. Police, uh, people had their, their, their heads cracked by the police. We even threw in uh, gas in, into hotels, uh, uh, posh hotels, where, where people would try to take refuge. And within 48 hours, there was an insurrectionary movement in Turkey. You can't describe it as anything else. A huge movement, an unprecedented movement of the masses. Which, which affected every single city, town, and village practically in Turkey. Certainly every province was affected. And by the way, the, you see the, the, the potential of the working class where the, there was a threat of a general strike at least. It wasn't expected. The bourgeois experts were left with their mouths open. Hmm. And the bourgeois strategists which had hardly recovered from their shock. When you had another brick falling in Brazil. Comrade Serge Goulart is present at this meeting. Serge, Serge has got a long history in the Brazilian labor movement. He's one of the founders of the PT, of the Workers' Party. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, Serge, if there's any precedent to this movement in Brazil. I don't know.
Certainly there's been no precedent for the last 20 years, that I'm sure. One million people came onto the streets. Most of them young people, because Brazil is a very young country. And that also began on a small question, apparently a small question. Increased bus fares in, uh, in Sao Paulo. And by the way, the movement itself developed those comrades that are particularly fascinated by transitional demands. There is a peculiar fascination among some comrades in the question of transitional demands. The movement itself put forward an excellent transitional demand. Quite spontaneously. It didn't need to be told by the Marxists. It came, it came from life, from experience. Free public transport for everybody. Excellent demand, correct demand. Should take it up in other sections. Free public transport. But you see, the cause of that movement was not the bus fare increase. That was not the cause of it. Any more than the cause of the movement in Turkey was, uh, was the question of this uh, park. It's the product of... Uh, uh, Trotsky used a marvelous expression which explains this. He referred to the molecular process of socialist revolution. Marvelous expression. Which is taken from, from chemistry, actually. You know, the, the mo molecules can move faster and faster. For example, when you heat water from, from zero degrees to 100 degrees, the molecules increase the speed. But water remains water until it reaches, reaches a critical point where there's a sudden change of state. Come, is that same law is applicable to revolutions. As a matter of fact, the same law is ap applicable to any strike in a factory. You can have many years, you can have 10 years where there's an, nothing seems to be happening in a factory. And the small minority of activists get very frustrated with the workers. I see some of our trade union activists are smiling when I say they know, they know it's true. And you say, well, it's, it's hopeless. These workers will never move. Look, they've accepted sackings, they've accepted wage reductions, they accept everything. They don't move, they will never move. But you see, beneath the surface, there's a small, an accumulation of small things, little pinpricks, little injustices. Which has a gradual effect on consciousness. Until one day, on a small incident, small, something small, there's, there's no soap in the toilets. The water is cold in the canteen. A, a, f a foreman uh, used bad language, uh, swore at a woman worker. And bang, you can have a, a massive strike. And the workers that appear to be least active and most backward are very often the most active in the strike. The same molecular process is taking place in societies everywhere. It's taking place in Greece, which we will deal with later. That's a very important question. The, the Greek Revolution, it's an important question. Oh, incidentally, comrades, incidentally, I was particularly pleased at the, at the explosion in Brazil. 
which showed a, a great leap in consciousness of the masses. And finally exposed the counter-revolutionary nature of football. <laughs> I hear a lot of applause and a few moans from the, the hardened football fanatics. Well, to, to be accurate, to be fair, comment, I don't think the Brazilian masses were injecting football as such. But they were certainly reacting against the corruption in, in, in football. Corruption in football. The colossal waste of money in prestige uh, 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 su subjects. These bastards of FIFA. It's FIFA, isn't it? These bandits, these, these disgusting gangsters that run. Because football, my friends, is not a sport. It's big business. Get that into your heads. It's big business. It's not a sport at all. And... Uh, Wasting money on prestige projects. <laughs> and Brazil being a poor country, there's many poor people. It ought to be a rich country, but it's a poor country. These bastards and these corrupt gangsters in FIFA were demanding impossible stuff. FIFA standards, FIFA standards. It cost a lot of money. That was a fact which produced indignation. It's the injustice, the sense of injustice. This is not right. And the same sense of burning injustice exists in every country. And this means that the, uh, it isn't just the economic questions, but it's not just economics. There's a profound sense, it's like a malaise, a bad feeling. Something is wrong, something is wrong here. People don't know what it is, but they know there's something wrong, deeply wrong in, in society. Look at the rampant inequality, the disgusting inequality. Look, in a crisis, for example, during the Second World War in Great Britain, and it was a thousand more true of, of Russia during the Civil War, a thousand times more. But even in Britain in the Second World War, there was a sense that we're all equal, we're all accept, we have to accept sacrifice in order to win the war against fascism. That's the way they, they saw it. The masses are prepared to sacrifice. They're prepared to make big sacrifices. Especially if they felt that power was in their hands. They'd be prepared to sacrifice everything. Their lives. Yes, but on one condition. First of all, it must be sacrificed for something that's a just cause. Something that is for us. And secondly, it must be the same sacrifice for everybody. What's the position now? Everywhere, everywhere, in Greece, everywhere, particularly in Greece. The poor people are expected to sacrifice uh, the living standards, sacrifice everything. For what? To pay the bankers. Is that a just cause? Is that a just cause? Does anyone believe that that's a just cause? And at the same time, the same bankers and capitalists are showing off ostentatious, obscene wealth during the crisis. Rob was telling me before we came here that in America, the United States, all the big banks have registered huge profits in the recent period, huge profits. In the middle of a crisis. And some of them have doubled their, their, their profits. Doubled them. While many Americans have to, many millions of Americans, it's shocking, have to go to soup kitchens. 
that depend on this. And people can see this. They know it. And therefore, there's an accumulation, there's a slow accumulation of profound, to put it mildly, profound discontent. A burning sense of injustice and anger. So you had uh, Turkey, immediately followed by Brazil. You know, we were discussing this in the IS in London. I think you will agree that the International Secretary acted very quickly on all these questions. But then immediately comes Egypt. I know that many comrades, I think even some people at the International Center, were inclined to think, well, maybe the Egyptian revolution is going down, it's, maybe it's run out of steam and so on. We had a discussion and I raised the point, I raised the point in the discussion <coughs> that the Egyptian revolution has huge reserves of popular support, huge reserves. which will be brought into action. I don't know whether it was one week or nine days that passed and you had the events in Egypt. Which, which is the second Egyptian revolution. Don't doubt it. It's the second Egyptian revolution. And it's unprecedented. Unprecedented. 17 million people on the streets of Egypt. 17 million. That makes even the Russian Revolution look small. And at the, at the end of June, the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, power was in the hands of the masses in Egypt. They had power. Power was in the streets. Lying in the street, waiting for someone to pick it up. And the tragedy of all these cases, comrades, this is not a cliche. It is not a cliche. I know that we've repeated this many times. And sometimes if you re re repeat something which is correct many times, It, may lo it can lose its, its force. But just look at the concrete uh, conditions in Egypt. It is a fact the masses had the power in their hands. Unfortunately, they didn't know that they had the power. And there was nobody to explain it to them. And of course, the, the bourgeois the who were terrified by the events in Egypt, they're actually terrified. They must have been stunned. Absolutely stunned, paralyzed. Turkey, Brazil, Egypt, Portugal, by the way. What next? Very good question. Very good question. They were stunned. And then I say, oh, no, 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 it's not a revolution, my friends, not a revolution. Oh, no, no, it's, it's a coup. It's a coup d'etat. Now, it is possible to bend the truth a little bit. It is possible to have a false understanding of, of, the, of the facts. It is even quite possible to tell lies. <laughs> but uh, if, if you want to tell lies, comrades, make sure that the, the lie that you tell is a little bit approximate to the facts. A little bit approximate. Uh, to my limited understanding, A coup d'etat is at the act, a conspiracy of a small minority behind the backs of the masses. 
What was the position in Egypt? The generals controlled nothing. The generals planned nothing. There was no conspiracy that brought 17 million people onto the streets. You know, the Boers are, they, they founded this business of a coup. They, they, they even described the, the Russian Revolution as a coup. You know, led in with a small group of, of conspirators, organized uh, everything. Now, if it were true that a small group of conspirators in October 1917 could lead millions of people to the seizure of power, Let somebody give me that recipe and we will take power in Britain tomorrow. <laughs> it is arrant nonsense of the worst sort. What it shows is a la complete lack of confidence in the masses. And in the case of the bourgeoisie, a fear of the masses, and I'll deal with the reason for that in a moment. It was a spontaneous movement of, of the masses. 17 million people, for heaven's sake. Where's the conspiracy? Where's the coup? What happened was that the army generals, they must have been absolutely terrified. And the ruling class, when it's threatened to lose everything, will always sacrifice something. If they'd clung to Morrissey, and they, ha they had a deal with Morrissey, by the way, they had a deal with the Muslim brother, who knows what would have happened? Let me spell it out for you. They, they, they were afraid, and they were right to be afraid, that the masses could have moved to take power into their own hands. They were, they were doing so. They were doing it. Where they surrounded the Egyptian parliament and they put up a big poster. This parliament is closed by order of the revolutionary people. And it was closed. And the same thing took place in, in many areas in the provinces where they seized, they seized the local councils or the town halls. And you see, if they, if, they could, if they could close the parliament, if they could close the parliament, if they could close the parliament, what was stopping them from entering the parliament and declare, electing a committee and saying, we are the government, to hell with you. Go to hell. The only reason that that was not done is that the leaders of the movement were still were confused, petty bourgeois elements, who did not know what to do in, in that situation. And therefore, there's a new stage now in the Egyptian revolution. But you see, I sometimes think, comrades, that we, get, we are a little bit lazy, mentally lazy, you know. I think so. I think so. We're too uh, happy repeating routinist ideas and so on, ideas we've said in the past, which, which may still be correct in the abstract. But we must follow the revolution as it develops, concretely, not in the abstract. Just look at the way that the Boos were reacted to the events in Egypt. They were horrified. They didn't conceal their absolute horror for what was happening. What was their big objection to this situation? What did they object? It wasn't so much that it was a coup. They can live with a coup. It wasn't even the fact that the revolutionary masses overthrew a government. 
although they didn't much like that either. What did they say? What are, what are they still saying? Oh, you, you can't overthrow Morsi. He's an elected democratic president. Might be some argument in favor of overthrowing Mubarak, but this man is a, like, like us, like us, democratically elected. And what happens when the masses, when the people actually decide to throw out an elected democratic government? Which they came, which they came very close to doing in Portugal recently, very close. In Europe, not in Brazil, not in Turkey, not in Egypt, in Europe. In Europe, I will deal, uh, deal a bit with Europe, which is a central point of this discussion. <coughs> but the entire strategy of the European Union, of the U European bourgeoisie, and the American bourgeoisie, and all the other bourgeoisies, is to put all of the burden of the crisis on the shoulders of the working class and the middle class and the poor people of society. And certain things will flow from that. I won't say too much on the economy because we've dealt with that, uh, I think, uh, considerably in the past, in detail. Just to say one thing, comrades, this is not a normal bourgeois economic crisis. It is certainly not a normal cyclical crisis. That's not the case. It is more like what Trotsky described in 1938, where he referred to the organic crisis of capitalism, that there was no way out. Now, when I say that, that there's no way out, We've got some very clever comrades around, you know. Actually read some Lenin, which is a very good thing. You should read more Lenin. You know, Ted, towards the end of his life, he said to me one day, with a look of perplexity on his face, he said, Alan, I don't know why, why Lenin wrote so many books. Because nobody reads them anymore. And if they do read them, they don't understand them. Now, Lenin said, there is no such thing as a final crisis of capitalism. That is correct. In the sense that there's that the capitalist system must be overthrown by the movement of the working class. It will not collapse automatically because of economic crisis. Economic crisis create the conditions for the radicalization of the, of the mass. But the task still remains that the system must be overthrown, <laughs> consciously overthrown. <coughs> and Lenin added, capitalism will always find its way out even to the deepest crisis. And that is also correct. But you see, the, it's correct as a general affirmation, as a general statement, it's correct. But just by stating those general statements, you by no means uh, come to an understanding of the real concrete position now. You must ask yourself two questions, two very concrete questions. 
How long will it take them to get out of this crisis? First question. Second question, at what cost? At what social cost? Now, the bourgeois themselves have answered those questions. One uh, bourgeois economist wrote, wrote in the Financial Times 12 months ago. It will take at least 20 years to solve the problems of the euro. 20 years. Okay. 20 years of constant cuts, attacks, austerity, and falling living standards. Now, that has consequences. That has serious consequences. As, as we've said in the past, you can express this almost as an equation. As an equation. All the attempts of the capitalists to restore the economic equilibrium will destroy the social and political equilibrium. That one sentence sums up the entire position that we now face. In the words of the economist, the economist put it very well. The road to recovery will be long and dark. And if anyone thinks, if anyone sitting here thinks that the workers of Greece or of Turkey or of Brazil or of Portugal or of France or any other country is going to sit for, for 20 years with their arms folded while there's constant pressure put upon living standards, conditions, workers' rights and so on, That person, I recommend, should immediately go to a travel agent and purchase a ticket to the moon <laughs> or the planet Mars. I think they're talking about pri private enterprise space exploration so they can try that. Such people, such people are not living in the real world. They're on another planet. And there are many extraterrestrials in the labor movement. <laughs> Starting with the labor leaders. And this brings me to the second part, another important part. The reformist, so-called reformist labor leaders, both the trade union leaders, and the, the, the so-called political leaders, both the social democrats and the ex-Stalinists, are living in a world of dreams. They're living in the past. They don't understand anything about the present situation. And the truth, the, the truth of the matter is, None of these people, not one of them, not a single one of them, has any confidence whatsoever in the working class. Not one of them. I include the so-called lefts, who are pathetic, pathetic people. Not one of them ever get any confidence in the working class. Not one of them talks about socialism. Or if they do talk about it, they don't believe a word of it. It's just for the speech, just for the audience. And it's, it's, an, it's an irony of history. It's a dialectical contradiction. Precisely at this moment in history, when the capitalist system is collapsing everywhere, When the market has collapsed, 
Even bourgeois economists like Nouri al Rubini understands this. He said, and I quote, in an interview organized by the Wall Street Journal, by the way, we thought that markets worked. They don't. This is Rubini. When the whole thing is collapsing, precisely at this moment, all the reformist leaders embrace capitalism and the market economy. They embrace it with the utmost fervor, with fervor. They defend it. They shore it up. They protect it. Same is true of the trade union leaders. You know something? The bourgeois cannot believe their luck. They can't believe this. Can't believe their luck. Who would have thought it? The fact is, and the fact is, and it's a monstrous fact, it's a fact, but it's a monstrous fact. That the organizations that were created by the working class to change society have become the main obstacle in the path of the working class at this stage. At this stage, at this stage. Now, does that, does that mean that we were wrong in our perspectives of the mass organizations? Does it mean that we have to change our position of the mass organizations? No, comrades, it does not mean that. These organizations will continue to exist. They have immense reserves of support in the population. And over a period under the crisis of capitalism and with big movements of the class which are inevitable, they will experience change. There will be a series of crises, splits, all kinds of things. You see that in Greece. Let us be clear about this. Of course, the sects draw the conclusion, no, no, we, uh, we don't need these organizations. They're finished, they're finished. No, 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 no. This is it's foolishness. This is foolishness. The masses do not understand small organizations. And therefore, despite their, their corruption, their rottenness, their extreme degeneration, The masses will turn to these organizations time and time again. Only for one reason. There is no alternative. Yes, but let's be clear. I'll come back to this question later on. The broad perspective of this international is correct and it remains the same. But that broad perspective does not answer the problems we have in relation to tactics today. Not at all. Doesn't answer it at all. But I'll go back to another interesting theoretical question. Twenty years ago, and this school of course is dedicated to the memory of Comrade Ted Grant. who was a genius, by the way. Ted was a genius. He was a genius. It was Ted that predicted 20 years ago that this was going to be the most turbulent period in human history. You know, our comrades are very nice people. And they're very polite people. And they wouldn't like to contradict Ted Grant. And they would, they would nod in the meetings, yes, yes. Most turbulent period, yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. Slump, oh, yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. But in their heart of hearts, shall we say that there was a little unspoken doubt? I'll never forget one comrade from Sweden. A lady comrade 
who's no longer with us, fortunately. Uh, and I'll say this, the communists know that I wasn't very fond of Sweden up until recently. It wasn't my favorite country at all. Now it is. <laughs> we have an excellent section in Sweden. But anyway, th this young lady uh, timidly put her hands up, because Swedes can be timid people sometimes, but timid. Just the most turbulent period in the whole of history. But what about the fall of the Roman Empire? <laughs> I said, yes, the fall of the Roman Empire was quite an exciting time. I will admit. <laughs> Come, look at the present world situation. I repeat, I repeat what I said at the beginning. There has never been a period so turbulent as this in the whole of the human history, including the fall of the Roman Empire. By the way, there are some interesting parallels between capitalism now and the, and the Roman Empire. That's another question. <laughs> History does repeat itself. But, but 20 years ago, when you had the fall of Stalinism, Ted made a very interesting comment, which remained in my mind. And it recently came back to my mind. He said the following. He said, the fall of Stalinism, of course, is a dramatic event, in his, one of the most dramatic events in history. That's true. But when seen in retrospect, when it's seen from the future, the fall of Stalinism will be seen as only the prelude to a far greater historical drama. The crisis of capitalism. Come, is that, that remarkable prediction is now a fact. But let's pursue this analogy a little bit further. Some comrades in this hall uh, will remember the events of, the, of, the, of, the, of 1989 in, in Poland, for example, in Czechoslovakia, in Eastern Germany. Others will not remember, but they will assume that you know about it. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. I personally did not expect this. Didn't expect it. Not, not in that form, anyway. Although Ted did, predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union as far back as 1974. And we knew that the, the regime was at an impasse. We wrote this in our documents. But when it happened, it happened suddenly. Where, where hundreds of thousands of people came onto the streets in East Germany, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, in Lithuania, also in Russia. Now, think, think for a moment. Here you have regimes, powerful regimes, apparently powerful regimes, totalitarian police states, with big armies, big police forces, a spy network that spied on, on everybody. The secret police, the Stasi and so on. Who would have thought, who would have thought that these regimes could be overthrown like that? And and fall like a house of cards under the pressure of the masses from below, a spontaneous movement. 
with no party, no organization, no perspective, no leadership. If you'd have told me that in advance, I think I would not have believed it. But it happened. Now you see, if I, if I were a bourgeois now, I think I would be seriously concerned and I think I would be thinking back to those events. Question. Could this happen again? In Europe. Under capitalism. In a democratic society. Could it happen? Ah, no, that's the question that they're asking among themselves. That's why they were horrified about, about Egypt. How can the masses take it into their heads to overthrow a democratically elected government? Democratically elected governments now in Britain, in France, and everywhere are not very popular, shall we say. In Italy, they're even less popular. And the weakness, of re the weakness of reformism, the weakness of the reformist organizations, which, which are using up their, author their authority, they're using it up, they're exhausting their authority to the degree that they support the cuts, the attacks on living standards. Ed Miliband. My God. It used to be known as Red Ed. <laughs> A few years ago, the capitalist press described him as Red Ed. The only explanation they can find for that, the translators will not be able to translate this, is that he wants his head red. <laughs> Needs to go to a psychiatrist. <laughs> Needs his head red. This, this, all, all you hear from the Labour leaders in Britain is, me too. Me too. You're cutting pensions? Me too. <laughs> you, you're, uh, uh, you're attacking the poor? Me too. <laughs> you know, you're uh, taking away trade union rights? Me too. Oh, riboso. <laughs> it's, it's as if they want to lose the election. No, but the, the, the fact that the reformists are using up their authority... <laughs> at a time when the anger of the masses is growing. Now look, work it out, think, think. You know, Trotsky once said, when, when there's no other alternative, you really have no other choice. Try thinking, start to think. It's not, not, not such a bad thing, you know, think that something is going to happen. And if the masses cannot find an expression through the existing organizations, then, as night follows day, they will move outside the mass organizations. But move they will. Move they will, be sure of it. Now, we, we must be careful about this. It doesn't mean that these organizations are finished, not at all. Because later on then, of course, there will be an effect inside. In, starting with the trade unions, they'll be shaken up completely. But, but, in, but in the short term, in the short term, we can expect all kinds of peculiar developments. And we must be prepared for all kinds of peculiar developments. You already see that. You saw it in Spain with the uh, Occupy movements. Many young people, many students, although they had a lot of support among the population and among the working class. 
But if, uh, and of course, it was a marvelous movement, it, uh, and it, as, as a symptom, it was the f f first rate importance as a symptom. But of course, a movement like that has got limitations. Sp spontaneity has its limitations. You know, we can fall into two mistakes on this question. On the one hand, on the one hand, we must understand that the motor force of all social change comes from below, comes from the mass movement. And therefore we would support this, enthusiastically we would support it. We mustn't have a formalistic, bureaucratic attitude like some of the sects. You know. They, they refuse to give the Egyptian, re uh, they, they refuse to give the Egyptian revolution a birth certificate. Because look, there the, can't be a revolution, no Soviets. Where are the Soviets? Where's the workers' council? Where's the workers' council? Where's the Bolshevik party? Where's Lenin? Where's Trotsky? No, oh, no, 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 no. Revolution? No, 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 no. No, no. No birth certificate, I'm sorry. You don't exist. The little detail that there's 17 million people on the streets, that they don't even see that. No, comrades, we must recognize these movements as genuine revolutionary movements, as popular insurrections, which are a, a symptom of a revolutionary crisis on a global scale. Of course, it is true. We're, not, we're also not anarchists. The anarchists uh, worship spontaneity. Spontaneity has limits. There's a certain naivety about the movement. Always the case in the first stages of the revolution, there's a certain naivety. And uh, the, because the people don't understand the seriousness of the situation. And the first successes of the revolution are dangerous, actually. They're dangerous. It all se seems very easy. It's simple, you know. Like in Egypt, two and a half years ago. The masses overthrew Mubarak. <laughs> with relative ease quite quickly. And therefore they thought that the thing was solved. Dancing in the streets. Yes, that's the beginning of the revolution. It always starts like that. And this idea of unity, all together, all Egyptians together. Is it? Yes, then you enter this, that, that was the case in Russia in February 1917 also. Then there comes a second stage. It's like a man that's been, or a woman that's been in a party all night. I very much fear that there will be such a party here in a few days' time. Not before then, comrades, because we need you in these sessions with a clear head in the morning. Oh, There's a big party, everybody's happy. And you have a drink, and you have another drink, and you have another drink. And the next day you wake up with a terrible head. <laughs> you know, never again. <laughs> till, till the next party, of course. <laughs> but it, it's, like, it's even like that in a revolution, you know. The, the Egyptian masses look around and they say, well, what has changed in this? What's changed? What have we achieved? The answer is that nothing has been achieved. Nothing. Nothing substantial has changed. Only the forms have changed. Democratic form. 
which is a which, as in all democracies, is a fig, fig leaf for the rule of capital, for the rule of the exploiters. And therefore, the, ma the masses took to the streets again. Very dangerous for the ruling class, because now they feel a sense of their power. You know? and, and therefore, the Egyptian revolution has only just begun. And it will go through a whole series of stages. Because on the basis of capitalism, none of the fundamental problems can be solved. Now, I said earlier that, that I, am, I am sure, I am sure, I'm certain, that the bourgeoisie must be absolutely terrified by the way things are going. They've entered into uncharted waters. I don't know if you understand. Like, like, a, like, a, a, like a sailor that's on an unknown ocean that he's not got a, either a map or a compass. And they're seriously worried about it. The Economist carried on its front page about three weeks ago, on its front page, They had a big article about international protest. And they had, I think it was four figures on the cover, four pictures on the cover, four, four individuals. The first one was 1848. That's interesting to begin with. You know, they're drawing parallels. 1848, it said underneath Europe. <laughs> then, it put, uh, then it said uh, 1968, USA and Europe. It is a bit stupid because they, they had, an, I suppose, an American hippie. Which, which, is, which is how those idiots understand 1968. You know, I was in Canada a few months ago. And I gave a speech on, on May 1968 in the French-speaking University of Montreal. It, I spoke for an hour in what I suppose is quite bad French, but they understood what I was saying anyway. And at the end, the first one that I asked to speak, he must have been a university professor, about my age. And he said, no, 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 everything you said is quite wrong. It's completely wrong. No, 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 no. I was in uh, France in 1968. I was in the University of Nantes. And it was nothing to do with the working class, nothing to do with it. Yeah, nothing to do with it. Yeah. Ten million workers occupied the fact there's nothing to do with that. That's nothing. To do with that. <laughs> nothing. Can't see that. No, 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 no. It was all the students, all about the students. And it was all about la révolution sexuelle. <laughs> the sexual revolution for those that do not understand the Gallic tongue. <laughs> yes. So I thought, how can, how can I answer this bloody idiot, you know? <laughs> no, no. Oh, he said, yes, it was because the authorities wouldn't allow the boys to get, get into the girls' dormitories. <laughs> that, that's what it was about. That's what it, you don't understand, that's what it was about. <laughs> so in the end, I said, um, well, I've listened uh, with interest to what you have to say. <laughs> By the way, did you ever get into the girls' dormitory? <laughs> it, it had a good laugh, and that was the end of it. It didn't bother me about it. Yes, but I'll come back to this business of the petty bourgeoisie in a moment. So, 1968, USA and Europe. 
Then 1989, the Soviet Empire. And the last one, now, everywhere. Everywhere. That's quite interesting. You know, they, they can see what we can see, what we should see. This is the risk of revolution everywhere. But even there, you see the petty bourgeois prejudice, you know, of the so-called intellectuals. God preserve us from the intellectuals, I say. You know, they, re they really have a complete organic contempt for the working class. In fact, in this meeting in Montreal, one of these student idiots informed us quite seriously, you know, the working class doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> We're all middle class. We had a worker comrade from Montreal present, a French-speaking worker comrade. He said, you know, I am really fed up of going to meetings where I'm told that I don't exist. <laughs> And I said to him, there's no working class. Why do, you think the, why do you think the light is working? Who put the light on? Was it God? Was it an act of God? <laughs> anyway, why, why bother with it? But uh, it, there's, there's just a little bit of truth. There's a bit of truth in it. In as much as in any revolution, it was true in the Russian Revolution, actually, in 19, 1901, 1902. In the, at the beginnings of the revolution, it's true that the students can play uh, quite a prominent role. Nothing surprising about that. But that's just a symptom, that's a warning of the future movements of the working class. The students and the working, the students and the intellectuals cannot play an independent role in, in, in society, it's not possible. But they are a very sensitive barometer which reflect deep-seated contradictions in society. So a movement of the student youth is always the prelude to a big movement of the working class a bit later on. That's all. Now, we must be prepared, by the way, for all kinds of uh, peculiar developments, all kinds of spontaneous movements, must be prepared. And we must intervene actively and try to win over the best elements. But, but we must understand and we must try to explain the limitations of a purely spontaneous movement. There's this naive, naive idea, if we occupy the squares, then that's in some mysterious way that will bring about a change in society. Of course it will not. How can it? You can sit in the square as long as you like. And if the bourgeois had any sense, they would leave them there. It solves nothing, and eventually the thing will collapse. It doesn't, doesn't really chal challenge the rule of, the, of the, the, the ruling class. For that, you require a conscious revolutionary party with a serious revolutionary program of power. Which is, which is what is lacking. Oh, by the way, just one interesting point. What they said about Egypt, when they overthrew Morsi in Egypt, so they said, how can the masses, it's not permissible to overthrow a democratically elected president, even if he's aut a bit autocratic. Yes, they didn't say that about Chavez, did they? They didn't say that about Chavez, who was democratically elected. 
Now, on the, I said I won't say a lot about the economy. Only, only to make this point. Somebody, I think it was Rob, said, said in the IEC. What did you say, Rob? He said, oh, yes, I remember now. He said, the capitalist system is, is nearing its limits. I think we must put it a little, little bit stronger than that. The capitalist system has already gone way past its limits. They avoided a crisis of overproduction for 20 years by using those instruments which should be used to get out of a crisis. For example, credit, the expansion of credit, and the lowering of interest rates. With the result, now they're in a deep crisis, they cannot use those methods now. It's impossible. They've been used. How can you reduce interest rates to stimulate production when interest rates are close to zero? It would mean the banks would be paying me for, for getting into debt. I can't see them doing that. Or the Keynesian argument, increase state expenditure. Why not? The state must produce, you know. The trade union leaders are singing the same song. Oh, let's have more government to spend more on the, on the national health and the hospitals. Very nice. Can't these people see? They got no eyes, they got no ears, they got no brains. Because the, the right wing comes back and says, My friends, my friends, we would be de delighted to do what you say. Wonderful. Spend more money on hospitals and increase living standards, increase wages. Good. Good. Tell us where tell us where to get the money. Don't you realize there's a deficit? And it's true, there are massive deficits everywhere. There are massive deficits. So the proposal to increase state expenditure under these concrete conditions, from a capitalist point of view, is lunacy. It can't be done. So there's only one, because people say, well, surely there must be some way that they, they, can, they can do this. Yes, there is. There is. There is. One way. Only one way. What is known as quantitative easing, which means to increase the money supply, increase the amount, amount of uh, money in circulation. Without a corresponding increase in production, You know, you, you don't have to be a genius to understand that if you do that on any scale for any length of time, it, as night follows day, it must lead to an explosion of inflation, which it suits neither the working class nor the capitalists, actually. And will merely prepare the way for, for an even deeper collapse and a deeper slump in the future. And by the way, they tried this. They tried it. They tried it in Britain. They're still doing it in Britain. They tried it in America. Only in America now they, they've begun to. They've got to with, with, with apologies to Steve, I'm referring to the ruling class here, Steve, not, not the Americans in general. The American ruling class is particularly thick, particularly stupid, particularly inept. They caused this damn mess in the first place. They caused this, this, this crisis of, uh, of credit by the irresponsible expansion of credit beyond all acceptable limits. Now they pay the price. 
So they realized that this quantitative uh, easing could, cannot succeed, cannot continue. First of all, because it does not work. It has not worked. It is not working. And it will not work. I hope that's sufficiently clear. You know, look at this. This is the, this is the slowest, the weakest recovery of any recession in the whole of history. Why is this? Because this crisis is not caused by a lack of liquidity. And because it is not caused by a lack of liquidity, it cannot be solved by increasing liquidity. <coughs> Let me quantify that statement. In the big American monopolies at this moment in time, they are sitting on a pile of money, approximately $2 trillion, which they have in their possession, and which they're not investing in production. In Europe, the big corporations are sitting on 1 trillion euros, which they're not spending on production on productive investment, on reducing unemployment. Why? Why? Because there's overproduction. The markets are saturated. People are not buying as they bought in the past. And therefore, put yourself in the shoes of a capitalist. Why invest money in building new factories and new plant and new machines? To produce cars which nobody will buy. That's the reason. So what's been the result of the quantitative, of, reduce, of keeping the interest rate low in America? What's the result? I'll tell you the result. The big companies and the banks have been bought, taking money at a very low in, rate of interest from the central bank and using this money not for productive investment because they're entirely parasitic but to buy shares in their own companies. Ah. I, why, I ask you, I, I hear you ask, why? Because it pushes the price of the share up. So you have the paradox of an economic crisis with big unemployment, hardly any economic activity, and a big boom on the stock exchanges. They're making fortunes, making millions, making trillions in the middle of a crisis. It shows the complete Bankrupt, rotten, corrupt, degenerate nature of senile capitalism. They're making fortunes. The huge fortunes are being made in the middle of a crisis. And at the same time, the masses are being told, you must sacrifice. We must all sacrifice. We're all in this together. Now, you see, people are not entirely stupid. And increasingly, I repeat, beneath the surface, in all countries, there's a burning hatred of the rich, particularly in the United States, I think, Steve. Particularly in the United States. There's a hatred of the bankers. I think they're a little less popular than pedophiles and serial killers at the present time. <laughs> Yes, but not only that. There's a hatred of politicians, of all politicians, almost all politicians. Not yet, there's not yet a hatred of, uh, 
of Tsipras in Greece, or of Melanchon in France, yes, but their turn will come. Their turn will come. I will predict now in relation to Greece, where the crisis has gone further than any other country. I don't know, I don't know how many communist presidents have been to Greece before. I've been to Greece many times. I was going to Greece for political reasons for about 20 years. I speak for myself. I love Greece. I love the country. I love its culture. I love its people. Marvelous, nice, generous, hospitable people. What has occurred in Greece in the last five years is a crime against the Greek people. Maybe you noticed when you came here. I noticed. You were going along at about, it was late at night last week. Lots of tavernas. Empty. Empty. Nobody there. You know, which wasn't the case before. But Greeks had a lively nightlife. The tavernas were full of life. Yeah, I know. <laughs> From personal experience, yes. I've got nothing to hide. They even made me dance once or twice. That, 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 was, a, that, that, that was a real laugh. You know, they got a good sense of humor, the Greeks. What's the position now? It's, it's a tragedy. Schools without books. Schools without books. Hospitals without drugs. Pharmacies without medicines. And people that only a few years ago were prosperous, even middle class people, rummaging in the dustbins of Athens to find scraps of food. There's been a, a collapse of, of, uh, of uh, life expectancy. Suicides. This is a, a, a dramatic uh, position. We will discuss Greece later on in the week. And the capitalists are continuing to put pressure on, on the people. Merciless pressure. Merciless pressure. More cuts, more cuts, more cuts. But, but you see, there's, there's a limit to how much people can, can take. It's as simple as that. Especially, as I said, when people know that it's not just, it's not right. If the Greek workers took power tomorrow, A workers' government in Greece would face certain difficulties in the first period, be sure of it. They'd face a blockade from the European capitalists. And uh, the workers, would, would, for a time, would face hardship, real hardship. Even worse hardship than what they have now, as was the case in Russia. Let me tell you something. The Greek people is a heroic people with revolutionary traditions. I don't think the comrades in this room understand what the Greek people put, put up with under the Germans. Some nice Greek music to accompany my, uh, <laughs> my remarks. Efresto Parapoli. The Greek people here suffered. Uh, can we switch all phones off, please, comrades? <laughs> Much as I love Greek music. Christito, Parakalo, Sintrofe, Ephristo Parapoli, Prochorume. The Greeks, under the German uh, occupation, no, no country suffered as much as Greece. No, sir. It's like people suffered starvation in Athens. 
Whole villages were exterminated. Populations put in churches and burnt alive. Partisans tortured to death. And the Greek people fought courageously. And I'll tell you this. The people of Greece would gladly accept problems and, and suffering. If they felt that the power was in their hands. And it was suffering for a, for a just cause. And that everybody is the same. But this, this criminal gangsterism. And by the way, you know, what's, wh where is the sovereignty of Greece now? Where is your sovereignty? Where is it gone? The Samaras government is, is in a mess. It's a, it's a weak government. It's, it will not last very long. And Samaras suddenly has become very religious. You know, he's found God. You know. He's praying. He's praying. Only for one thing. September. September. Why is he praying for September? Because there's elections in September. Where are the elections in September? Not in Greece. In Germany there's elections. And they're hoping that Frau Merkel will get re-elected and will soften her heart and throw the dog a bone. That's not, none, of that, none of that will happen, by the way. None of that will happen. It's an, ex it's an extreme political crisis in Greece. Now, what's been the result on consciousness? I have heard people, not in this organization, I've heard some people, especially the, the so-called lefts, saying about Greece, oh no, there's a danger of fascism in Greece. That's the, there's, no, there's no revolution, there's only fascism. This is complete nonsense. We'll discuss this uh, later on this week. Golden Dawn is, is quite small, as a matter of fact. Although, although it could grow in the future. But at the moment, the whole movement is to the left. How many general strikes have there been in Greece? I can't remember. 25, 26, I've lost count. Anyway, 29 days of general strikes, anyway. Comrades, is that nothing? Is that nothing? Big general strikes, big demonstrations. You know. And I ask you, what more can you ask of the Greek working class? What more can you ask of the youth of Greece that occupied the towns, the squares, and so on? But the question is this. After all these struggles, what has been achieved? The answer, nothing has been achieved. And nothing will be achieved on that basis. Let, let, let me explain. And that goes for all countries, by the way. There are circumstances in history in which uh, strikes and general strikes and mass demonstrations can bring a, force a government to, to, to change its plans, to moderate its position. It is possible. But this is not a situation like that. The crisis is too deep. The bourgeois have no reserves. And therefore, no matter how many strikes take place, or demonstrations, they are forced to stick the knife in even deeper. Does that mean to say that we are against strikes and demonstrations? Well, obviously not. We are enthusiastically in favor of strikes and demonstrations. 
only for one reason. Because through the collective action, the workers acquire a sense of their own strength and unity and power. That's the, that's the real uh, purpose of it. But as for changing the plans of the capitalists, no. The trade union leaders in Greece, as in all other countries, are dreaming. They're dreaming. They think that it's possible to go back to the good old days of reforms. Why can't we have reforms? Why can't you give us more money? Give us a bit more money and we'll spend more and the crisis will be solved. These people are, are not capable of understanding history. They only see the ass of history. They're obsessed with the ass of history. And the reformists and sects even more so are obsessed with that particular part of the human anatomy. <laughs> and the, the answer to these gentlemen was provided by the economist quite a, about two years ago. They said, sooner or later we will return to normality. Yes, yes, sooner or later. But it will be a new reality. A new reality. No reforms, no pensions. That's, that's the real point. Not a reduction of pensions, no, no pensions. The economist said that. You work till you drop, you work till you die. That's, that's the real program. Yes, but that program is, is sufficient to, to create a revolutionary ferment in society. The first reaction of the workers and the masses is, is obvious, it's clear. Strikes, demonstrations, take to the streets, protest, yes. yes. It's a necessary stage, a necessary phase. But it won't solve the problem. And therefore, at a certain stage, the workers move from the industrial front to the political front. And they will test one party after another. One leader after another. One program after another. And of course there will be violent swings. We must be pre prepared for this. There will be violent swings of public opinion to the left and to the right. Be prepared for this. It's inevitable. Parties will be destroyed. Wiped out. Look at the PASOK in Greece. The PASOK at one time had 50 or 60 percent. I can't remember. Stamati? 48. They had nearly 50 percent. What have they got now? Pardon? 7% and falling. And falling. Syriza, on the other hand, which is a left, which was a split from the Communist Party, actually, years ago, has experienced a rapid growth, a lightning growth, from a position where they were struggling to get 4%. to where they almost got 30% in, in a few months, in a few months. Tsipras was, was giving left speeches at the time. But the point is this, it's very simple, it's not difficult to understand. If you accept the capitalist system, and they all accept the capitalist system, including Melanchon in France, they all accept the capitalist system, then you must accept the laws of the capitalist system. And under conditions of deep crisis, it means inevitably 
you will have to accept responsibility for carrying out deep cuts. That's a fact. So we've got no place for any sentimentality here, any illusions or any nonsense. You must proceed from elementary facts. Tsipras, in recent months, he's not talking to the Greek working class. He's not talking to the masses. He's talking to Merkel. He's talking to the bosses. He's talking to the bankers. Such is the high level of consciousness of the, of the masses in Greece. And I will give a, I'll give a statistic now which will surprise you. It's led to a fall in, 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 in the popularity of Tsipras and Syriza, even now, even before he comes to power. <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, when there's a next uh, elections in Greece, which may come sooner rather than later, the Syriza will, 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 will get a, a big result. And there'll be a, some, probably some kind of a left coalition. The composition of which I won't speculate on, but some kind of a left coalition. And now a marvelous Greek uh, comrades, they've done marvelous work. Because they had the correct perspectives, as a result of that, uh, as a result of the correct uh, ideas of the comrades, and the international, I might add. They are now in the right place at the right time. I won't say much more because we have a whole session on, on Greece. At the end of the school, which all the commons will greet and myself will greatly look forward to. In Italy, there's a permanent political crisis. They can't form a government. They didn't have a government in Italy for months, I think. And they managed quite well, actually, with that. Now I come to think of it. I suppose that's an argument in favor of anarchism, I don't know. But you, you can't go in a deep... The crisis in Italy is deeper than in Greece, objectively. It's deeper than Spain. The debt is two trillion euros. And in, Greece, in, in, in Italy and Spain, it's the same position. The bourgeois must make deep cuts. And France, by the way, is only one step behind. Only one step behind. You know. For that, you need a strong government. They couldn't even form a government in Italy. And you get the strange... For, well, they had to rely upon Berlusconi. Who's, as you know, he's a very ill, a very sick man. You know that? <laughs> yes, he's very sick. He's not, not generally known. He suffers from a serious illness. He can't keep his trousers up. <laughs> serious problem. <laughs> and he's likely to go to jail. It's an even bigger problem. But in the last elections in Italy, you had this strange phenomenon of a, of a party led by a comedian, Pepe Grillo. What, what did he get? Was it 25%, wasn't it? What did he tell How much? What percentage did he get, Pepe? 25 It's the biggest party, isn't it? All right. In the lower house, it's the biggest party. A party led by a clown. No, I, I suppose uh, many Italians say, well, Italian politics is a circus anyway. So one more clown or one less clown won't make much difference. And at least this clown makes criticisms of the regime, which he does. He does. He does. But it, I mean, it's, it's no joke, Tom. It is a serious observation. I think some comments have not understood this because they're, they're thinking in a routine manner. They don't understand the shifts that are taking place. 
the indignation of the masses in Italy, for example, it's clear. It's not just against the right-wing parties. It's against the so-called left-wing parties also. And it, it, that shows the existence of the beginnings of a revolutionary ferment in society. The workers and the youth, the advanced workers and youth, are beginning to draw revolutionary conclusions. In Greece, the, the, I saw there's, a, there's an astonishing statistic in Greece. I said that I, I know this country quite well. I do. And I, uh, I spoke at this meeting where we launched a very good meeting of over, over 100 people. First time in the history of the Greek section for the last 30 years we ever had that number. In a meeting organized by us directly, that is. <clears throat> and I said the following. <clears throat> the Greece, which I, I've not been to, to, to Greece for about 10 years, I can't remember, a long time. 12 years, I think. I said, the Greece that I've returned to is not the Greece that I left t 12 years ago. This is a different country with a different people. I said this, look, 12 years ago, even five years ago, if I would have come from London, from London, and said, talked about socialist revolution in Greece, most people would say, well, uh, they wouldn't understand it. We sound like Chinese. Now, I said at the meeting, and I repeat it here, now, I could go to Athens today and speak to anyone. Not just workers, but taxi drivers, small shopkeepers. And I would say, what is required in Greece is a revolution. They would say, yes, that's what's needed. I guarantee it. Comrades of the Greek section, yes or no? Ne yohi. Ne yohi. Then I could think tipita. Piotinata. Ne. Which in Greece means yes. You know. Now we can prove it. It was an astonishing statistic. It's published in one of the main daily papers in Athens in, uh, I think, December of last year. A few months ago. 68% of the people of Greece say we need a fundamental change in society. In my understanding, a fundamental change in society means a revolution. And 23% said directly, we need a revolution with that word. That means that 91% of the Greek people stand for revolution. What's the problem? If you had a serious revolutionary party in Greece, even a party of, say, a thousand, less, 500, you would grow rapidly under these circumstances. Our problem is we started from a very small base and we hope that the commons will grow rapidly. I'm sure that they will. Especially after Tsipras comes to power. But the problem is what? None of the existing parties is expressing what the people really and genuinely want. So when we talk about a lag in consciousness, the real lag in consciousness is not with the masses, but with the so-called leadership. Which is lagging a thousand miles behind the masses. 
And even many, of, I'm sorry to say, many of the activists of the trade union and labor movement have the same skeptical mentality. Comrades, in this situation, the situation in your country, in your town, can change like that. Sharp and sudden changes are implicit in the situation. And therefore, we must be prepared. Are we prepared? That's the question you must ask yourself. Have we really and truly underst understood what's happening in the world? Have we really and truly drawn the necessary conclusions? Not just in a general theoretical sense. What we're talking about here is not a revolutionary outburst in this or that country. Don't, don't you understand it's the same process. It has the same causes. Whether it's in Tunisia, Egypt, T Turkey, Brazil, Greece, Portugal, tomorrow Spain, which in my opinion is on the verge of, of, of an explosion. Don't forget that Spain and Italy are the traditional countries of anarchism. And the fact that the work workers' leaders are, 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 have gone in for class collaborationism of the worst, most disgusting type does not make a social explosion less likely. On the contrary, it makes it a thousand times more likely. You see, the bourgeoisie now face, faces a, a big problem. Some people say, well, are there similarities between this situation and the 1930s? I answer yes, there are definitely big uh, similarities. But there are also big differences. You know, it's very important that we learn from history, that we make historical analogies. That's very important. But we must not mechanically repeat what Trotsky wrote, for example, in 1938. There are also important differences. The main difference is this. If you look at the period from 1917 to 1939, there were many revolutionary uh, outbreaks. Take Germany as an example. In November 1918, the power was in the hands of the German working class. But the German social democratic leaders handed the power back to the bourgeoisie, betrayed the revolution. You had the, Spart <coughs> the Spartacist uprising in Berlin in 1919. You had a Soviet state in Bavaria declared the same year. Then you had a move towards reaction in the form of the Cap Putsch as an attempt to, at a coup d'etat by the generals, fascist generals, which was defeated by the, a, a, a mighty general strike of the German working class. You had the adventure of the March action led by the, the Communist Party in 1921. Which, which was a, a bloody defeat. But then in 1923, you had the tremendous crisis, the occupation of the rule by the armies of French imperialism, colossal hyperinflation, and Trotsky explained, power could have been easily taken by the Communist Party of Germany. But unfortunately, the German communist leaders 
under the influence of Stalin and Zinoviev, uh, failed. They failed to take power. Now, you see, you, you had all these things. But uh, if you take Italy as an example, there was a big movement of the working class, I think, in 1919, I think it was. Occupation of the factories. When they didn't take power, it moved very quickly in the direction of fascism. In Spain also, the bourgeoisie moved quickly, quickly in the direction of fascism. In other words, the, the situation was settled quite quickly, one way or another. What's the position now, however? For the last 50 years, in Europe, and not only in Europe, there was a big upswing which wasn't, uh, well, theoretically it was predicted by Lenin, actually, theoretically. There was an upswing of the productive forces for, for decades, which meant the delay of the, the, delay of the revolution. the softening of relationship between the classes. And the isolation of the forces of genuine Marxism. We had to fight against the tide for almost 50 years. Now the tide is turning, beginning to turn. Capitalism is, is in its deepest crisis ever in the whole of history. And they cannot afford, not, not, not only can they not afford new reforms, they cannot afford to maintain the reforms which were given for the last 50 years. They must destroy these reforms. Yes, but there's the, here's the problem. As Ted repeated many times. The growth of the capitalist economy for, for a long time, well, it, meant, it meant a nightmare for the Marxists. It was a terrible situation for us. You know, our arguments didn't seem to fit in with, any, with the real experience of the working class. It seemed to be remote. Yes. Yes. But on the other hand, Ted explained that the development of the productive forces was positive because it strengthened the working class everywhere. Not only in the advanced capitalist countries. There's been a development of industry in Brazil, in Turkey, in Mexico, and other countries, Indonesia, and so on. Now the bourgeoisie faces a serious problem. The social reserves of reaction have been severely reduced. Before the war, you had, there was a big peasantry in Europe. It wasn't long ago that there were 60% peasants in Greece. In Italy, there was a huge peasantry. In Spain, the peasantry was, the, and Portugal, the peasantry was the majority. Even in France also, there was a big peasantry. And even in Germany, there was a, a very big peasantry, which is a base for fascist and Bonapartist reaction, as a matter of fact. Think of the Austrian peasants, you know, all about that, you know. The Lederhosen gang, you know. Blut und Boden, you know. Yeah. Catholic uh, reaction. It's just finished. It's finished. It's finished. And the other layers, who in the past were fascists, okay? I'll name them. Teachers, civil servants, bank workers, yes, and students. The students before the war were fascists in the main, in most of these countries. What's the position now? 
the people I've the, the strata which I've just described are not reserved for fascism and Bonapartism. They're the most militant sections of the revolutionary movement. Conclusion. There cannot be a, a, a quick solution to this crisis. It's impossible. The bourgeoisie cannot immediately go over to reaction in any country. They don't have the base for it. If they tried that in Greece tomorrow, there'd be a revolution. They'd provoke a revolution, as a matter of fact. Civil war, at least. And therefore, this crisis will continue for years or even decades. With ups and downs. You must be prepared for this, comrades. Please do not have a utopian, rosy-tinted conception of revolution. Please, please forget that. This is, this is going to be a hard period, a very hard period of hard struggles, and that's absolutely necessary in order to change the consciousness of the working class and, and the youth and the masses. That softness, those illusions, that, that naivety which still exists in people's minds, the belief in democracy in this kind of stuff. It will be knocked out of their heads by hammer blows. By policemen's truncheons, by gas. No, it won't be easy. There will, there will be defeats. There will be moments of despair, of tiredness. But under these conditions, Every lull, every setback will only be the prelude to new explosions. And of course, in the course of these events, the mass organizations will be radically changed. They will be shaken from top to bottom. All kinds of crises, splits and so on, yes. Therefore, our task will be to, 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 to uh, face towards the mass organizations, of course. But the problem of problems is this. And I'll finish with this. You see? Our ability really to intervene in the, in the mass movement in the future... to intervene not just in words and articles, but effectively in practice, will be determined by one thing and one thing only, our ability to build the tendency today, not tomorrow, today under these conditions. And we must be flexible. <laughs> Tactics is not the same as strategy. We have a broad strategy, we have a broad perspective. That is correct, that's okay. But tactics are not determined by the strategy, not at all. They're determined by concrete conditions. And therefore the only uh, the tactic is, is, is an art. Perspectives, Trotsky made that point. He said, perspectives is a science, but tactics is an art. The essence of the art of tactics is this. We must watch carefully real developments in society. Real developments. And be prepared to intervene energetically. And to face the most revolutionary elements, not the most backward and tired elements, the most revolutionary elements.
and to face them with the program of the socialist world revolution. And with our organization, the international Marxist tendency. And if we do that, if we work correctly, if we win and educate the best layers of the youth and the working class today, then we will be in a very, very powerful position to intervene in the crises and the developments which inevitably will occur in every single one of the mass organizations of the class starting with the trade unions. Comrades, that is our task. We must feel the world revolution, not just understand it, not just in our heads. We must feel it in our heart, in our soul, in our blood, and in the marrow of our bones. And therefore, if we proceed with the necessary sense of urgency, to build the organization, then our ultimate success and the success, the success of the world socialist revolution is guaranteed. <laughs>